I'm Ed Griffin. I'm a writer. I write um, controversial works. I think they're very important works. I deal with such topics as uh, banking history, uh, health issues, um, the United Nations, U.S. foreign policy, kind of topics where people get all heated up because they have strong opinions. But I consider myself to be a, a researcher and uh, I try to be a historian as best I can. So I deal with facts, mostly not in uh, opinions. Um, I've been doing this most of my adult life. I started uh, becoming interested in issues of this nature uh, in 1959. And by 1960, I was really revved up to it. I left my employment with a large insurance company and went in full time in doing writing and, and speaking on these topics. The growth of the Tea Party movement and the left-right paradigm, they're all sort of intertwined, and yet there are very separate intellectual threads that need to be followed in all of that. I think, first of all, it's important to talk about and understand this left-right paradigm. What is this all about? Most of us, including myself for certain, uh, in my younger years, I was brought up um, thinking that you had to choose, uh, if you were smart at least, you would have to choose uh, politically between being on the right or the left. You had to have a political view. And I thought that in those days, I thought that the extreme right would be something like fascism or Nazism. And on the extreme left, of course, you would have communism or socialism, just a little bit short of that. And so that was, that was the paradigm that uh, I was taught, and it seemed to make sense at the time. But as I became more involved in these issues and, and learned more about them, I began to realize that the basic philosophy between the so-called extreme left people and communists and socialists and the so-called philosophy on the right of the fascists and the Nazis was really the same. I said, how can this be? They're supposed to be opposites of each other. And then I began to realize that there is something more common to all of these philosophies that was left out of my training and education. And that was the ideology of collectivism. I began to realize that the thing that was common to them all is something called collectivism. Now that's a word that um, is not very well used. It's not very uh, entrenched in the uh, vocabulary of most people today. But I found out that it was a very commonly used word about a century ago. People wrote a lot about collectivism, and the opposite of that would be individualism. Those are two words that are sort of uh, abandoned today, but in my view, I think they need to be uh, recaptured and uh, understood and used more. And I realized that communism and fascism, the so-called opposites, are merely variants of collectivism. They're the same thing. And they believe that the group is more important than the individual, for example. And the individual must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. They believe that the state should be all-powerful and that uh, the people should obey the state for the greater good of the greater number and all of that sort of thing. Um, they believe that rights are uh, granted by the state. They're not, uh, they're not part of the human being. They're not, they're not God-given. They're not entrenched in his body and soul. They have to be granted by the state. All of these things, and you look at them one by one, communists and fascists and Nazis and socialists, they all believe that. So wherein lies the conflict, you see? And I began to question that. And I realized that it's partly a trick. It's a, in fact, I think it's a huge trick. It's a great scam because people even today are thinking that they have to choose between the right or the left, not realizing that no matter which way they go, they've accepted basically the same ideology underneath. Now, it's true that the leaders of these groups, like the, the Stalins of the world and the Adolf Hitlers of the world and the Mao Zedongs of the world and so forth, the, the leaders of these groups on left and right will fight each other and they will go to war with each other and there will be tremendous battles, as we saw in World War II, for example. Uh, but what are they fighting over? Ideology? Not at all, because they agree on ideology. What they're fighting over is dominance. Who is going to rule? That's all they're fighting over. And once you get that picture, historically, it's not too difficult to see that that's the same thing going on even today, as certainly going on in American politics. We have 
the left versus the right sort of embodied today in the Republican Party supposedly on the right and the Democrat Party supposedly on the left. Now, here's a choice, isn't there? Well, why is it if this is such a choice that so we go from Republicans to Democrats and then four years or eight years later we go back to, to Republicans again and we keep doing this? We've been doing this since World War I. How come the country keeps moving in the same direction all the time, deeper and deeper and deeper into collectivism? regardless of which party is in, in favor, because they both believe in collectivism. They both believe in big government. But their slogans are different, their leaders are different, but the poor voter out there trying to make sense of all this is, uh, he's tricked, he's stuck, he's trapped. And so this is the, the important thing to, uh, I think, understand that this left-right paradigm is a, uh, it's a political ploy. It works very well for those who know what they're doing. We find that the Republican Party and the Democrat Party both are pretty much in the, the hands of a, of a relatively small group of people with a membership of about 4,000. It's called the Council on Foreign Relations. These are the people that are really pulling the strings in both the Republican and the Democrat Party. And they've even written about it. There's a fellow by the name of Carol Quigley, who's a former history professor at uh, Georgetown University. Uh, by the way, he um, was the mentor of uh, William Clinton when Clinton was a student there. And, um, and he wrote several books about uh, this group of people and their origins and their roots coming from Europe and England in particular. And uh, he comes to a very interesting point in one of his books where he says, okay, this is the way the real world is. He said, how is it that we collectivists, we elitists, how can we rule the world when at the same time we want to let the average person think that they're living in a, quote, democracy. They're living in a system where their vote counts. They're living in, in this world in which they feel that they must participate in their own political destiny. This is a carefully nurtured myth that they want to create so people will be content with no matter what happens to them, they'll say, well, I voted for it, or I did it. This government is my government. No matter how bad it is, it's, it's responsible to me. And as long as people have that image, then they don't complain so much about how bad it gets because they did it, they think. So Quigley deals with this question, how do you let people think that they're directing their own political destiny when at the same time we, the elite, we are the ones who must direct their political destiny without them knowing it. How do you do that? And he answers the question brilliantly. He said, it's very simple. You've got to have two major political parties, and they'll both have the same major goals, the same basic fundamental principles, and they'll argue with each other uh, on, uh, on the surface with slogans and leadership and style and all of that sort of thing. He said, but we will control them both. There's the strategy. There's the whole scam behind this left-right paradigm. When you understand this history and this reality, you look at it and you say, well, yes, we've got a left wing and a right wing, but they're just opposite wings of the same ugly bird. And that bird is called collectivism. So how does that apply to the Tea Party movement that we see today? There it is, I mean, that's the blueprint. The Tea Party movement seems to have been a very genuine, spontaneous uh, movement arising from uh, people who were unhappy with both the Bush administration and the candidacy of Obama. They didn't like either one of them. They were people who understood more or less, maybe not intellectually and historically, but that there was collectivism in both parties, but they understood that something wasn't right and they didn't want more of the same. And so the Tea Party movement you know, based, just think about it, what does that mean? The, it goes back to the historical episode where the uh, colonists in Boston dumped the Tea Party into the in Boston Bay because it was a protest against the taxes the, and the uh, restriction of liberties and the Stamp Act and so forth on the part of Great Britain against the colonies. And so the Tea Party movement really was a rebellion against big government, no matter what camp it came from, whether it came from the Republicans or the Democrats. Well, it didn't take long, uh, especially when the Tea Party movement began to gain momentum. And uh, I was privileged to see that because I was invited to participate in some of these early events. And I remember the first event I went to, maybe they had a couple hundred people. 
uh, but they were all, you know, dedicated to the principles that made this country great. It had nothing to do with Republicans or Democrats. It had to do with political philosophy, uh, the concept of limited government and the people being in charge, not the government in charge. So I saw it start in a small fashion like that. And then over the next couple of years, it grew and grew and grew until finally it was a very large movement. And at this point, the uh, political parties, the leadership of the political parties began to take very careful note of it. And they said, wait a minute, this is, this is something we should be doing because they're experts at orchestrating uh, movements and letting the people think that it's their movement, you see. This was a genuine grassroots spontaneous movement. Had nothing to do in the beginning with political parties. Well, the, the leadership of the parties couldn't let that be, so they both looked at it very carefully, and the, the Democrats decided that because of the, uh, the nature and the slogans and so forth, it didn't fit well. So they began to attack it. They began to try and make it look like it was a bunch of uh, uh, idiots and wackos and tin hat people and all this sort of thing. And the Republicans thought, hmm, this is something we can use. And so they started to go into it as best they could and take it over. That was their goal, to copt it for their, uh, for their program. And well, so here we are today looking at this process underway. They're still trying very hard to convert the Tea Party movement into a Republican front. And I'm sorry to say that they have achieved some success in that direction, primarily because of um, some very well-known people who are closely aligned with the Republican Party. Uh, we're talking about uh, the candidate, of course, Sarah Palin, who is a Republican from top to bottom, and she represents this right-wing image. She fills the bill perfectly. She's, uh, she's the Miss Republican right-wing collectivist. And uh, she can speak with great uh, uh, fervor and great emotion and great, uh, and great meaning against the extremes of the Democrats, those le bad left-wingers. And she does a good job of it, and everything she says is true. But she doesn't speak out against those bad right-wingers, you see, because she's part of that group. Her mission is not to bring about a restoration of the principles of America, but to get the Republicans back into power. That's her mission. And of course, we have people like Glenn Beck, who have the power of, of the Fox broadcasting system behind him. That's tremendous power. And he's always speaking against those bad left-wing Democrats and with great conviction and great fervor and great truth. Nothing wrong with what he says. What's wrong is what he doesn't say. He'll never uh, attack a uh, somebody from the Republican Party. We've got people like Rush Limbaugh plays the same role. He's very good at exposing the Democrats. He's very good at uh, pointing out the absurdity of the left-wing philosophy, but he'll never say anything bad about a right-winger or a, a Republican. So there you have it. Of course, on the Democrat side, you've got the same the same team, you know, this is, these are the cheerleaders and, and the players, they work together. And the average voter gets caught in the middle of this. He hasn't any idea what's going on. He just thinks that the debate is, is such that he has to choose. What are you, who are you going to vote for? Are you going to vote Republican or are you going to vote Democrat? And so as long as they're in that role, they're like a, like a tennis ball in a uh, tennis match. They get hit back and forth across the net. First they're on the right, bing, then they're back on the left, bing, back there on the right. They're Republican, they're Democrat. And the game goes on and on and on. And although it's possible for the players of that game to win, the, the tennis ball never wins that game. So I think it's time for people to stop being tennis balls in this game and, and just get out of the game completely.